Good afternoon, everyone. Today we're here to talk about, well, it's a call for action, building a hub for effective cybersecurity. We are going to briefly introduce you to the speakers, but before I begin, I want to warn you that we have a couple of questions for you. We'd like to know your view viewpoint. Therefore, have your mobile phones at the ready um, to, to respond to the questions. So, I'm Janice Richardson, French-Australian. Uh, I am chair of the Education and Skills Working Group, and let me hand over to Walt, who will introduce himself, and then the speakers will all introduce themselves. Yes, uh, thank you, Janice. My name is Walter Nathus, and I'm the coordinator of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Standards, Security, and Safety of the IGF. Um, I was supposed to moderate this session, but unfortunately, they brought the two sessions out today at the almost the same time, so I'll be dropping out quite soon. And Janice kindly took over the moderation of, uh, of the session. Um, I think that that is enough introduction for me, so I'll hand over the microphone so that everybody can do a very fast introduction of themselves and they're on both ends, so we'll let's see how that goes. Let's begin with Anya. We have such a long row here. So <laughs> uh, yes, uh, my name is Anna Rewczyńska. I represent NASC, which is National Research Institute, and I'm coordinating their Polish Safer Internet Center since 2006. And we do awareness activities. We also have the hotline and uh, helpline that we cooperate with the NGO that we have uh, a center with. Thank you. Maciej? Uh, hello, my name is Maciej Groń. I work for uh, also for uh, NASC Research Institute. I'm a lawyer. I deal with the uh, regulation, especially in the cybersecurity, and also the cooperation with the uh, universities. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Hiko Hiroling uh, from the PwC Japan, and my focus is uh, product security, the manufacturers, uh, IoT, uh, IoT devices, uh, security things, and I'm facing the, all the Japanese manufacturers and also the hiring the students or something like that. And nice to see you guys. Hello, uh, my name is Ismaila Jawara, and I am from the Gambia, you know, chair of the Gambia Information Security Community, and also work with the Gambia Revenue Authority. Hello, uh, my name is João Falcão. I am a Brazilian. I I'm the vice chair of the Youth Standing Group, and I also work in cybersecurity field as uh, the tech lead for development of cybersecurity tools. If we can pass it along to the other side and introduce the rest of our speakers. And we do have one speaker online. Is Emmanuel ready to introduce himself? I go ahead while we wait for that. My name is Dennis Susar. I am from the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, I mostly cover e-government uh, and IGF in my work. Uh, good afternoon. My, my name is Silvia Piechna. I work at NASC in the Cybersecurity uh, Prevention uh, Department, and I'm mainly involved in children's safety uh, project. I'm Larry Magid. I'm a CEO of Connect Safely, which is an NGO based in Silicon Valley. We work in the area mostly of child safety, but also safety for all stakeholders, as well as privacy and security. And if you see me typing, I'm not checking my email. I'm actually the rapporteur, so my, go my job is to try to remember some of what happened today and summarize it at the end. So, Walt, Kim, sorry. Good morning, my name is Raul Echeverria. I'm the executive director of the Latin American Internet Association. Sorry about that. Uh, this is Yuki Kadobayashi from the National Science and Technology. I also do cybersecurity education and research, and I also lead uh, some cybersecurity training program for industry. I'll talk about the program later on. Thank you. Is Emmanuel, Emmanuel no. So okay. We will 
And did you start her? What? Can I ask you to tell us a little bit about the IS3C, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Janice. Um, so the IS3C is a dynamic coalition within the IGF system. And we announced ourselves in at the virtual IGF of 2020. And we made sure that we had something to report on and plans in 2021 in Katowice in Poland. And last year, we use this meeting. It's better, I think. Thank you, Raul, because I have no clue if you can hear me or not. Um, so in, in Poland, we introduced our plans. And last year in Addis Ababa, our first report was presented, which was made by Janice Richardson and her team on education and skills. And this year, we'll be presenting three reports, a tool, and the announcement of another tool. So we are really hitting our stride, more or less. And what we are going to discuss today is that it's very nice to have a digital report on the, an obs fairly obscure website called Internet Governance Forum, but how to actually make sure that it moves into practice. Because this dynamic coalition, we want to make a difference and not just have a nice report out. And what Janice is going to present on today and we're going to discuss together today is an idea of a cybersecurity hub. That's where I will start the work and not uh, this, uh, my, that part of my introduction and not to take any way, anything away from Janice. But how do we actually start moving? The question we, f we face as IS3C is to how do we move from theory to practice? And that goes for all working groups. So we have a working group on security by design of the Internet of Things that will pr produce its report of two days' time in our dynamic coalition session. We have a working group on procurement, on government procurement and supply chain management. How are those ideas going to be translated into action so that governments start procuring ICT in a secure way and not in an insecure way? We have a tool that is going to be developed to help them with that so that they have a list of the most urgent and, and important internet standards and ICT best practices that they can start using when procuring. I'll stop there. There are more working groups. One that's going to start hopefully is on emerging technologies. What we're discussing today is the report we produced last year on tertiary cybersecurity education. And what we found is that the curricula, most universities and, and higher education schools do not match what industry demands from them, let alone what society as a whole demands from them. And this is a gap that needs to close, and it needs to close in a few different ways. Obviously, is the content of these education curricula. But what about facilitating a mid-career change for people who may want to start working in cybersecurity? How to close a lack of experts in gender and may how to make it more attractive for youth to work in cybersecurity? And that is something that is being discussed for t probably two decades, but the gap is not closing. And we have some ideas to close that gap, and that is what we will be discussing today. But how to proceed? We think that it's important to bring the right people together, to create the context wherein people can start discussing this on an equal level. And what better place to do that is the IGF, because at the Internet Governance Forum is one of the only organizations where no matter if you're from government or just somebody with a private interest in a topic, can discuss at the same level, at the same amount of importance and equality. So how to bring these people together and get them out of their silos? How to make something work that so far seems to have been beyond reach? And how to motivate people to join? How to find funding for this important work that determines all of our future? In this workshop, ISVC, in cooperation with Insight, which is the company of Janus, and NASC, who presented themselves as well at this table, we present the concept of the cybersecurity hub. A hub where cooperation starts and concepts are turned into actions and capacity building is developed and supported. 
in this session you will be invited to share your views after the presentations of our panelists. And unfortunately, I cannot be present for the whole of the workshop due to a schedule issue that could not be solved. So I wish you a fruitful discussion and I certainly look forward to see your input online when I'll look at the, at the session. So instead of being the moderator, I'm handing over the microphone now to Janice who will take the rest of the session and when I leave, you know why I have to excuse myself. So, so thank you very much and I hope we have a very good session. Thanks, Wout. And as Wout said, if you wish to intervene after each speaker, you can. You can ask questions. We would like this to be an interactive session. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the study that we did in 2021. We managed to reach 66 countries. We began by 30 interviews from countries as far-flung as Australia, Nepal, the United States, and of course, many centered around Europe. What did we learn? Firstly, from people from industry and business who participated, we got a very clear idea of the profile of what they're looking for in cybersecurity. Firstly, creativity. Of course, critical thinking. That's top of everyone's list. Teamwork seemed to be extremely important, but holistic thinking, this was the big complaint. Young people who leave university, who come to the workforce, are not holistic thinkers. They do have good communication skills. This is very important. They are insufficiently diverse. Women are not joining the workforce. Young people don't seem to be very keen, in fact, to be part of the cybersecurity industry. We got quite a different picture from the people from education who participated. Yes, they agreed critical thinking. They agreed in theory, but where are we in practice? They seem to place a lot of focus on coding, on learning about specific product, products, and I'm glad to see that many of us agree here. But, industry points out, they are not teaching young people how things function. Young people arrive, they do not really understand how the internet works. What is the backbone of the internet? How does cloud security work? All of these issues remain the gap, I would say, between what industry wants from people who join the workforce and what tertiary industry is putting out. Of course, we know what's happening. Companies are training their own young people, school leavers, but this leaves us with a workforce who know today's products, but they don't have that very broad education base to permit them to adapt to all of the changes. And we've seen so many changes over this past year even with chat GPT, BARD, and all the rest of the generative AI that's rearing its head everywhere. So what is the cybersecurity hub that we're dreaming of? It will be a place where industry and tertiary education sector are present. And as an educator, I would like to say that all education could be should be present because if we don't learn how things function from a very early age, we're not going to jump in and learn when we reach our teens. We need authentic resources for young people to learn with. And this could be an area of exchange also. We need to understand the best practice. For example, in Denmark, they're already doing something like this. So how can we do it at an international level? As Walt said, who are the people who should be involved? How do we get them around the table? These are some of the questions that we're hoping to answer during this session, and we're hoping that you will participate now, but as we move forwards with this cybersecurity hub. I'm going to continue 
the discussion, unless anyone has any immediate questions, by handing the floor to the team at NASC. NASC has been our partners way back since we actually created the InSafe Safer Internet Network, Safer Internet Net Day, etc. And once again, they've been our partners in the report, in the study, and as we move forward. Can I ask you, Machet, to tell us a little bit about the experience in the field of NASC? Thank you very much. Uh, I think that we are uh, uh, one of the few stakeholders that are uh, um, who, who came to, to the global IGF straight from the local IGF. Uh, just, on, ju just, just this Wednesday, we had uh, uh, our local IGF in uh, in Wrocław in Poland, and uh, and uh, and that's because we have the lucky to have you know the stopover in our own home city, but also. Uh, but uh, I can boast that you know our uh, uh, IGF in Poland uh, uh, was there was al almost um, uh, 800 uh, re registered uh, people. And first time uh, in the first time, uh, youth IGF constituted the majority of uh, pa uh, participants. So it's a, it's a big difference, and you know this year was uh, was really uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, before I, I talk about you know ex our experience on building the uh, awareness and education, I will tell you just just a few words about you know the NASC because the NASC uh, NASC which is a research institute connected to, uh, who, uh, who, who has connected uh, Poland to, uh, to the internet over 30 years ago. And today it is a re re register uh, of uh, internet domains, but also we are um, responsible for many issues related to digitiz digitization and, and especially cybersecurity. Uh, we are in the, our national uh, uh, cybersecurity system, uh, we are uh, um, uh, we are the uh, c um, computer security incident um, response team. Uh, we are um, 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 res re responsible for, si for cyber security uh, uh, for everyone except the military and government. And uh, that's why uh, uh, education and uh, uh, building awareness is, uh, is for us very, very, very important. And uh, the last years, uh, we have uh, we, we trained uh, uh, thousands of people. Uh, we have our um, um, uh, so-called secure VIP uh, training, uh, and there was um, uh, more than uh, 1,700 uh, trainings uh, sessions were held for over 3,000 people, individual, individual and uh, multi-person training. Uh, we have uh, trained the uh, members of parliament, of, gar of government, minist ministers, uh, uh, independent authorities uh, like uh, Financial Supervision Commission and many others. Uh, uh, we also training, you know, the uh, uh, local government uh, uh, authorities. Uh, recently, we have uh, also started training in the healthcare centers. Uh, we also uh, have uh, um, a large influence on the legislation in, 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 uh, of the le legislation. Uh, we uh, work out our, uh, our opinions and uh, recommendations to, to the ministries, especially the Ministry of the uh, Digital Affairs. Uh, we uh, we are entering the uh, into in increasingly better and closer cooperation with the chamber of uh, of lawyers, especially the attorneys at laws and bar barristers. Uh, also, from our point of view, uh, the Zinfo is, uh, has been a big challenge, uh, and we uh, we train not only. We train not only uh, ordinary uh, people, but also the uh, the um, uh, journalists. Uh, also, we have uh, 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 two years ago we have established the cyber, cyber science center. This is the uh, this is the uh, uh, coalition of three universities in Silesia, uh, uh, and we uh, uh, also provide with them. Uh, 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 we have launched uh, postgraduate uh, courses in uh, cybersecurity management, and the last one, 
Uh, what, uh, the f last thing which I want to uh, underline is we have also the established a, a partnership for cybersecurity. This is the new platform uh, when we meet uh, people from the uh, private sector and the public sector. And uh, we still uh, uh, see that, you know, the uh, cooperation between private and public sector and especially the edu uh, we, we want to combine, you know, the uh, education sector and the business, private business, and we, uh, we deeply think that it's uh, very important and we, uh, we, that's why we uh, want to cooperate with the rest of the world and that's why we think that the hub is something that is uh, very uh, important. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, if you could please pass the microphone uh, to Yulia. Uh, I'll pass this one along. Julia is in charge of IGF Youth Poland and uh, wants to look at this from the perspective of tertiary students. Julia. Is it on? Yes, it is. Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, so I would like to share with, with you with um, our, our um, experience with involving young people, uh, tertiary education um, students. So since uh, 2020, uh, under the patronage of NASC, we, um, the, the youth IGF Poland has been run as a part of uh, international global IGF uh, that, that is operated under United Nations. And uh, the main goal, goal of, of, um, of Youth IGF Poland is to, um, uh, is to create an open uh, forum for exchange of experience and uh, views among young people and ex experts from different fields and, uh, and backgrounds. And uh, one of our main objectives is also to create, um, to establish a community of um, uh, young professionals um, interested in new, in new technology, in internet governance, while encouraging uh, youth participation in uh, national and international events, for example, uh, IGF, uh, global IGF, um, or our national uh, Polish IGF uh, that was uh, uh, initiated in 2016. And um, just a few days ago, like Maciek uh, mentioned, uh, we organized IGF Poland. And actually the IGF Youth was a very focal and very important part of uh, the events, um, event ad ad agenda. And this is a case actually each year since 2016. And um, this year, uh, inspired uh, strongly by, uh, by the research that Janice uh, uh, um, presented you, we decided to strengthen our force and ac activities addressed to reach young people even stronger, and uh, also to involve universities, involve uh, representatives of academia in our activities, because these are two very important and vital um, target groups that should be um, that should be addressed uh, while talking about uh, bridging um, cybersecurity sk skills uh, gap. And um, so, um, from March to June 2023, we organized seven meetings with uh, tertiary education um, students at several Polish universities. Uh, the topics covered during these gatherings um, uh, involved, for example, um, cyber policy, uh, internet governance, and uh, privacy, and human rights in the uh, digital realm. We also presented them opportunities uh, available to join IGF uh, youth. And um, we also discussed and presented them the opportunities um, mm, uh, that mm, that are available in uh, professions connected to new technologies, and um, and uh, what is also very important, uh, we invited them for uh, joining um, competition uh, with a prize being attendance here in Kyoto. So today uh, we are delighted to have two competition winners with us. Alexandra and Jakub. And the last very important thing is the questionnaire that we 
prepared and invited young people to, to participate. And uh, this survey is not meant to be a representative one, but it's rather as serve as an initial, initial uh, analysis of students' attitudes and concerns in online uh, security and uh, career prospects. So I will just present you a few findings from this uh, questionnaire. For example, uh, the top career interest uh, for young people is artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. And 15% uh, of um, our respondents attended university cybersecurity courses, while 21 participated in uh, uh, external cybersecurity cyber trainings. 71% believed that cybersecurity training during the, their studies is, uh, should be mandatory. Also, they think that. Um, Education about cybersecurity should be involved in all educational levels, even in uh, preschool. Uh, what is also important, um, they think that like, according to well, soft skills like teamwork, communication, uh, were considered by 89% as crucial as technical skills. Uh, also, they think that uh, cybercrime, according to 99%, and data leaks, according to 97% were identified as major cybersecurity threats, and 63% expressed concern about future uh, cyber attacks. These are only selected findings, and uh, 139 respondents uh, went and participated in this uh, in this um, questionnaire. Thank you. So if I can now turn to Anya, and some of you may be thinking, but where was this, where is this initial report? How can we see the results? Well, you can very easily go to the IS3C website, and there you can get the report in English and in Polish. Anya. Yes, uh, in my few minutes, I would like to relate very strongly to what Jenny said in the, in the very beginning, that the <coughs> cyber security competences education is not actually the question only for the tertiary education, but it's also the responsibility of primary and secondary education. And I think we strongly believe that the idea of the hub, that one of the goals of the hub, would be also to create recommendations on adopting school curriculums to the digital transformation. And um, having at the NASC uh, Cyber Threat Prevention Department and having a Safer Internet Center for over almost 20 years or 17 years, we are in a permanent uh, dialogue with schools. We prepare educational materials for them. We organize events for them. Uh, we have youth panels that we talk a lot uh, and consult all the situations. And I'm very interested how it is in your countries. I hope to learn a lot during this workshop. But in Poland, um, there is really a significant need to focus more on media education in schools. Um, and lately, when we were recently <coughs> When we were preparing educational materials for schools, the school scenarios, we did the research with our teachers. We asked them what are their needs just to prepare those scenarios exactly, like meeting their, um, their needs. And I would like to share with you a couple, uh, couple of results that we got from them, like asking them what they think about actual media uh, education at schools, and especially in the fields of um, cybersecurity. And according to the majority of teachers, it was 57%, they said the existing curriculum is not adapted to the realities of technological development. Almost 30% believe that they don't have sufficient knowledge, like the teachers don't have sufficient knowledge, even to recognize if something is happening bad for children, like if there is any sign of a problematic usage of internet among students. 57% uh, of, uh, of teachers that we asked, they say that they have only like two lessons, like twice for 45 minutes a year to talk about cybersecurity and, and uh, internet safety. Uh, and of course, they think it should be multiplied. Uh, mostly, they, uh, when they talk about the obstacles, why they don't raise media education in schools, they say that there is lack of time, like that the curriculum of schools is totally not adjusted to the need of, um, 
of coming future. And they also consider a big problem the lack of cooperation with parents in the general kids environment. So I think in Poland at the moment is happening a lot. Like there's, there are many, many very good changes. But we need uh, a bigger focus to change the curriculum. And all what they say was that we need to include digital competences in the since first years of education. That was what the teachers ended their questionnaires when talking to us. So I think we will talk a lot also about this primary and secondary education in fields of um, cybersecurity competences. Thank you, Enya. So we've looked at some of the necessities and from what age we should start integrating these into education. We've also looked at the local or the national level, Poland. Let's jump now to the international level, the United Nations. And I'd like, like to ask Dennis Souza to take the floor, please, and to tell us a little bit about how we can push for this cooperation at the international level and the multi-sector level. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Uh, first of all, I would like to start thanking uh, the National Research Institute, NASC, uh, IS3C, and also Janice to you for inviting us here. Uh, I think it's a very good learning opportunity for us as well, this, uh, like turning this theory into practice and what can actually do uh, in action uh, with with governments, with other stakeholders uh, uh, in the field. Uh, I think this is a very, very good. Ex this is a very good example, and it has great potential. So, I, 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 while listening to the participants, I was thinking like where we can uh, where we can use this actually uh, in which area, and and I I, I prepared some uh, like major cybersecurity related activities from the UN, but I think this group here is very familiar with what I'm going to s uh, say. So instead of that, uh, one thing that comes to mind is um, in our division, we look at uh, e-government, how 193 uh, member states are using uh, ICTs to deliver services, as well as uh, the most populous city uh, in each country, we look at them and, and we do a lot of uh, capacity building in the area of e-government, uh, including uh, with the local public of officials uh, and cyber security, uh, cyber security both from the supply side, from the, from the government, uh, but also from uh, digital skill side, from the demand, like how people uh, is aware of uh, the issues, the threats. Uh, I, I think uh, this this hub uh, could be a, a great resource for for both sides. So I just want to put that on the table. Uh, other than that, uh, please stop me when I run out because uh, I, I think uh, I just want to highlight the main uh, things from my notes. Uh, this group is familiar with the UNGGG and open-ended working group, etc. But one of the things. Uh, that may not be familiar is the uh, Secretary General recently in 2022 uh, established a high-level advisory board on effective multilateralism. Uh, one of the significant recommendations from the board is uh, expanding the definition of threats to peace and security to include digital harms. And then uh, in their recommendation, they also call for greater capacity building. Uh, so this is, again, uh, it fits there. Uh, but other than that, uh, the global digital compact, etc. these are all security part of it. Uh, but I will not go to those principles. I see that this group is more action oriented. So I'll stop here. And if I have any other ideas, I'll come back. Thank you very much, Dennis. And uh, I think it's important that we do look at e-government also because that's where the necessity is and governments are also doing their own capacity building as we hear. Um, we are now going to turn to industry um, and we're going to call on Professor Yuki Kadobayashi. Yeah, right. Is it right? Yeah. Here is the microphone. Please, let's hear about it from your point of view. Thank you. Uh, so this is Yuki. And I work for a graduate school, and I have many PhD students here. Also, I have many uh, training, trainees from industry. 
I run a uh, cybersecurity education program in industry, uh, uni university, as well as cybersecurity training pro pro program for uh, industry. So uh, I would like to very much resonate what uh, Janice said in the beginning. There is a huge gap between what university is doing versus what industry wants. But there is a valid reason for that. For instance, university needs to innovate. University wants to, for instance, invent AI, whereas industry needs to use AI. So there is a huge gap because if we, for instance, uh, try to develop industry training program, we, we teach them how to use AI securely versus in the university, uh, we teach them how to invent AI, right? So there is black box versus white box thinking. So there's a huge contrast, and this is with valid reason, and, uh, and there's a huge gap. And, uh, but I know, uh, because I know, I, I do both, I mean white box teaching as well as black, black box teaching. And the industry training program, for instance, in Japan, which is a huge program, uh, which is funded by METI, and $20 million every year, it's a huge program. And uh, we, we actually teach them how to use devices, how, we, how to use cloud security, for instance, how to implement zero trust, how to implement uh, DX with security. And uh, this is kind of multi-disciplinary, uh, like you, you need to, uh, you, how to use uh, cloud, how, need, how to use zero trust, how to use AI security, how to implement IoT security, versus in the university, you have to implement IoT security, for instance, secure coding, et cetera. So this is like uh, two, phase of, two phase sets of different, pr uh, same problem, right? And uh, in, the, in the industry training program also, uh, we invite them to uh, do a good teamwork, work in a team to solve this huge problem because the problem is multifaceted. IoT, AI, robotics, cloud, in a huge corporate system. So you need the intrinsically uh, teamwork for problem solving. But in the university, you must be first author of some paper. You must uh, uh, insist, I did something, right? So you must prove that I'm innovator, I'm excellent. So because of that, I cannot uh, invite uh, every student to do teamwork and graduate all along because of the credit requirements and the graduation requirements, et cetera. So I think the university system is a bit old from the cybersecurity perspective. So uh, I stop here and the for further question. Thank you. So it, it seems that really we have a dilemma here. How do we put together the black box and the white box without getting a gray area? I'm wondering, is Emmanuel online now? Right. Well, you're going to do the work now. If you can take out your mobile phones, um, can we let you lead us on this, Katrina? Yes, do you have a microphone? Yes. So you're going to have a question. You're going to have to think about the various options that we give you, which will come up on the board. But first, we need to tell you where you go with your mobile phone. OK, give me a second. I need to, I need help. <laughs> need help. Okay. Yeah, I need, need help, help because from? I need to share my screen. Where should I click? Oh, probably somewhere here. Oh, it's here. If you tell them where to go, no, they will. No, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah. So we are going to have two questions for you. Let's start with the first one. Can, um, can you enlarge of the course. QR code a little bit, maybe? Yeah, let's do it full screen. Um, yeah, well, I'm going to. So you can join us by um, using the QR code or just going to menti.com and putting in the code 67413964. So let's go more slowly, menti.com. That's right. And the code is 67413964. It's also here. At the bottom. It's there, very large now, they can see it. Yeah. I, 
Are you online? Do you have the question? Yes. Yeah, we have 13 people online. Super. So what we would like you to do is to prioritize. Very good. Good job. Yeah, so you have to drag the answers from mm, the most important for you to the least important. And now our question is, what should be the key functions of the hub in order of priority? And of course, we are relying on your input here so that we can really see what you think should be the priorities. Okay, we are still waiting for answers. Don't be shy. We have 19 people and eight answers only. How many now? 13. We want to give you time because we do want you to think about it. Exactly. It's a very complex question. And if you have finished, doing it. I'm wondering, is there anyone who has a question that they would like to ask at this point? We've been throwing information at you, um, but we haven't heard very much from you yet. Okay, I think we are ready. Okay, we'll move on then to the next question immediately. There is a second question, and I will give you the microphone, Joe. Let's go to the second question. Which practical steps should be priori prioritized to launch and build the hub? And please vote on the most important. I know that here on the screen it looks small, but if you look at it on your phones, probably more visible, but we have define a strategic plan, like goals and objectives, secure funding and resources to establish and maintain the hub, create an online platform to deliver training, workshops, and so on, seek accreditation or recognition from relevant industry bodies or government agencies, and develop marketing and outreach strategies to raise awareness and attract partnerships. You can pick only one here, yes. We are picking the one which is, in your opinion, the most important. Uh, thank you. Well, I would like just to comment on the our uh, last question because about the necessity of uh, bringing the uh, cyber well the companies closer to the students because well I have the experience of learning and uh, the problems I had because most of the systems that we try to test the security are very expensive, very specific, very difficult to, to put your hands on. So uh, connecting the people that want to learn with these kinds of resources uh, definitely eases the learning process. Well, it makes it possible. Thank you, and I think that's an extremely pertinent comment, and it's one thing we hope that we'll manage to do with the Hub. I think we have our answer. Please tell us, what is the priority according to the people here? The priority is to define the strategic plan. So first, we are going with goals, objectives, of course, long-term vision of the Hub. This is the most important for 12 people, and then I think a good one is also create an online platform to deliver training workshops and networking opportunities. 
Great, and that's really something that came up with the students, or the PhD students, that we were working with on the interviews and the survey. Samoa, for example, Nepal, both said there is no opportunity in our country to actually do this type of training. We are now going to move on to our speakers. Uh, as Dr. Emmanuel is not online, I'm going to ask now Raul Echeverria um, if we could please hear from you. Thank you very much. Um, um, I was asked to, to speak about the, the how prepared are the, the companies, private companies in Latin America. Um, but let me provide some context. I, th I think that's everything that has been said here is uh, applied to the, the, the whole world, I think. Mm -hmm. It's not a regional um, issue. But in 2022, um, according to a study that was, uh, very, uh, was disseminated broadly in, in the region, uh, almost 70% of the companies, different kind of companies, um, declared to have had some kind of, uh, of uh, security problems in the, in the region. Um, it was, uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, monthly <laughs> studies, but uh, to see how the, the, those issues are, are, are evolving. But, uh, the, but everybody could see this year, uh, just in the press, the very uh, big events, and, uh, big e security incidents in the regions, uh, both at the public and private sector. And, Two governments uh, faced uh, serious uh, attacks, uh, uh, Costa Rica and Colombia. In the case of Costa Rica, the, the, the government w was really it's, uh, um, in, um, um, in difficult conditions to continue working in several areas. And uh, uh, the case of Colombia was also very, uh, was very recent. And, and, um, but also well, private companies have, uh, have been in, in the press even in delicate uh, areas like uh, law firms, uh, very famous law firms that have been uh, uh, attacked and all the information of their customers have been compromised and, uh, and we don't want to know what kind of information they had. <laughs> but the, so the, the, the point is that companies are, 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 being, are becoming more, more concerned about this, what is good. Uh, they say in every survey they, the companies uh, seem to be more more uh, to be more conscious about the, the risks and to uh, uh, consider the security risks as um, uh, important issues. But the point is that uh, it, it is not reflected at the at the time of allocating resources, and and when in difficult times as uh, we um, faced the last couple of years. Uh, it was uh, demonstrated by some service that some studies that security is one of the of the areas where the resources were cut uh, first. So the, uh, that that is a, a at the end of the day, it seems that uh, it means that they don't understand really the risk uh, that they are facing until they have a problem. Like uh, uh, usually, the, the 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 problems are in the form of uh, RAT attacks uh, and the the. the um, uh, inf access to information blocked and, and the, the, the criminals ask for randoms to ransom sorry to to uh, free the, 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 the access to the information and in those cases uh, companies in average are losing uh, a few million three four millions in the for attack that uh, is is uh, the, they could have spent uh, less money in the in uh, in trying to prevent those situations. Uh, I think that there is a need of massive programs, and I think that it is very interesting what we are discussing here about the skills and, and human resources because this is a problem. In a, I, I have read in the news and in, in Mexico, the uh, study says that only in Mexico there is a need of uh, 200,000 people and uh, to work in this area. So this really is an impressive uh, uh, number. Um, but uh, but so we need we need to to create to implement some uh, scalable solutions and, and massive programs. It, 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 it's, it's not enough that 
that uh, some with public uh, uh, resources we support uh, the companies to implement uh, or try to to educate we need to do something in a massive demand it is very interesting that the the number of companies that uh, say that they are um, adopting new measures is increasing uh, um, approximately 10 percent per year but the tax are increasing in 20 percent so <laughs> so, uh, so we will not uh, win this uh, button in this uh, um, and so we had the at, uh, one of my hats is that I belong to the Uruguayan chapter of Internet Society, and we started to work with the Global Cyber Alliance uh, the, to disseminate uh, um, some measures uh, for SMEs. I think that this is something that that could be done. One of the things, but uh, but uh, we should try to to find uh, for solutions that are scalable, so as I say before, and try to reach. Uh, much more uh, uh, bigger audiences than, than we are doing now. Thank you. Thank you. So here I think a few important points came up that who we're talking about when we talk about the cybersecurity industry. Well, in fact, we all have to be cyber secure. The farmers, the trades, everyone needs this cyber security. The second thing I think of specific interest Attacks increasing by tw increasing by twenty percent, but resource allocation increasing by ten. So we are not going to get along very far if this situation continues. Our next speaker, I think, is going to tell us more about the expectations of the private sector, if I'm correct. And I'm going to pass the floor to Hiko. Um, who works here in Japan. Over to you, Hiko. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Hiko. Uh, I'd like to share something. The graduates uh, after finish the school and join the companies. And uh, currently I'm working in the PwC, uh, do the consulting for the cybersecurity for the, all the industries. So we are also hiring those people. And before that, uh, before PwC, I was uh, working for the Panasonic 18 years. So I was the interviewer for those uh, grads, uh, more than hundreds of people. And what I think about, I'd like to share is, uh, well, those graduates, uh, they have very plenty basic good knowledge for the cybersecurity, which means that it's all past, very good, very good. And why? Because I think, uh, maybe in Japan, we uh, collaborate with those uh, university, like uh, Kadobe, Professor Kadobes, and we go to all the university school to meet the professors and introduce those students uh, what we are doing, for example, what we are doing for the cybersecurity for the Panasonic or the PwC. We explain those people and let them understand uh, what we are doing so that maybe make them interesting. And so we communicate, not the student, to communicate with the university, the academia, industry. Uh, it's the very important things for the kids, I mean for not the kids, uh, graduates. So uh, I think this is the one good idea. And also uh, we are very encouraged the internship as well, you know, uh, for the not payment, not pay or uh, we pay, but still if those people are very interesting about to do something internship, we always open to let them work, to feel like what they are doing, so that maybe they have some imagining for the uh, cybersecurity job. So this is also important, so it's make more opportunities, chance to give them. And also, uh, uh, what we can done to have more specialists that meet the business needs, uh, I think uh, this is a very interesting story. Uh, three months ago uh, in Japan, uh, there is a uh, one high school, uh, very uh, major in technical high school, with the cybersecurity companies together, trying to do the workshop for the hacking the ship, the maritime. Yes, with the real operation one for the ship, with the student and cybersecurity companies together, trying to attack and defense exercise for them, and. I think it's so very exciting. You can use the ship and trying to attack and feel like what they are doing. And so 
those high school students very exciting way. Maybe we can do some maritime cybersecurity job in the future. So we need to give them some experience, real experience, which is very important. And also, uh, usually the corporation uh, doing some cybersecurity conference sponsor. So we also invite those uh, students for free. If we, you know, it's sometimes the cybersecurity conference is very expensive, right? You know, 1,000 USD or 500 USD, I'm not sure, but the thing is very expensive, but we get them for free to join. And may, of course, maybe let them do some brand here to so do some small job, but let them also introduce those uh, cybersecurity people, uh, introduce them and so that they can make the connection and maybe you can uh, uh, help support those, uh, their future. Uh, I think I'm gonna stop right now, okay? Thank you so much. Um, but I have a question for you because the cybersecurity industry or what we learned from the research is that they're really looking for a very diverse workforce. They need the younger, the older, the males, the females. It seems to me that you're talking about students. Do you have any great ideas to help along these mid-career shifts? How can we get a more diverse population involved? Do you have any ideas on that? You mean the mid-career shift? I mean, does that mean that once they work for different uh, job, I'm trying to jump into the cybersecurity? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I think this is a very important thing. Yes, uh, actually, uh, some people are not very good at software engineer or you know don't know about the cybersecurity, but they're trying to jump in to the cybersecurity job to carry carry a change. Uh, we also uh, accept those uh, people because I think the cybersecurity, they, they have very different view, point of view. I mean, they have the engineering technical and also the governance or regulation. And they, I think cybersecurity have many jobs uh, involved. So I think I'm very encouraging those people to jump in. And if you need some uh, training, we're willing to support them and to let them make some different career for the cybersecurity. Yes, we do that. Okay, because it seems to me that, that a lot of people in their career aren't aware that in fact they could do this switch. I think that you have something to say yes. here. Yes, please do. Yeah, for uh, such kind of a career change, actually industry needs it, not the employee needs it because uh, Maybe they are, uh, you know, have been working for factory for 10 years, but uh, they are not aware But the company needs cybersecurity people in factory because factory is becoming more digitized. And uh, because of that, we have industry-sponsored training program where a company chooses those nominees, not the, indi not the in individuals. And they send us uh, the trainees to the one-year program. So it's a huge one-year program, right? Full-time one year from nine to five every day from Monday to Friday. They come to our facility and uh, study and do cyber exercise, programming, penetration testing, defense exercise, everything uh, from like uh, uh, July to June. It's whole one year. And they do a lot of teamwork and they do a lot of presentations. They do a lot of uh, uh, simulated exercises like briefing to CISOs, briefing to the boards, briefing to accountants, reporting to those lawyers, and lots, lots of those business-oriented exercises. So it's one-year program, it's, it's huge, but uh, we have a lot of alumni by now, like more than 350 alumni, and everyone say, I was new to IT, but after finishing this program, I'm actually a cybersecurity specialist, and being able to defend a company, I'm very proud of it. But this regards one year, and uh, there is huge industry uh, backlash against, like management saying, do you actually require one year? But uh, from our experience, this kind of cybersecurity training needs one year because of those huge technology stack and uh, lots of regulatory and uh, uh, legal <laughs> and, uh, developments like uh, standards and regulatory developments and uh, you know <laughs> like uh, <laughs> lawsuit and the case laws and uh, every complexity has to be taken into account in business context. So this requires a huge amount of time. But uh, with this one year investment. One person can change from some person like lawyer or salesperson to cybersecurity professional. We have many, many living examples in Japan. Thank you. 
Thank you. So that does seem a very interesting good practice that other countries could benefit from. I'm going to pass the floor now to our youth. Uh, jo Joel, I'm sorry, I have a lot of trouble with your name. Can you please remind us where you come from and tell us your point of view on this? Hello, uh, thank you, Janice. I think uh, the best way to start talking right now is actually telling a story that happened to me uh, last month. I was visiting a factory, and as the uh, a cybersecurity specialist, I need to understand, to really understand what th these factories work, how they work. And uh, I s sat with them and spent like a couple of hours asking everything, how each one of the machines worked, and uh, I said to the person, okay, I have, well, we have two weeks to me to understand everything and point your errors. So uh, the person looked to me and said, okay, so you are like a generalist specialist. And <laughs> yes, so uh, to me, this shows the, the most uh, difficult part of cybersecurity, which is that you, you need to, to have a, a transversal uh, knowledge. You need to understand, to deeply understand how these machines work to, to know what they shouldn't do. And uh, this makes a huge bar barrier. So when we have people like pivoting their car careers, you can take advantage of the knowing uh, the sites, their, their factories. But when you are bringing uh, young uh, participants, you don't have this advantage. So uh, the person needs to, to learn all of it. And this is incredibly difficult. Like I had the opportunity to sign up for a course on industrial security. And the first task was, okay, uh, tell me more about uh, the space you work for because we are going to work on uh, on net. And I said, what? <laughs> space? Uh, machines? I, I don't, don't have any experience with these machines. And the person said, oh, okay. And uh, this became a major issue to me. So uh, being uh, the being a young person uh, entering on this uh, subject in the beginning was actually a very lonely task because you ha it was just only you and your computer learning uh, how to uh, work with these systems and how to, ex uh, to exploit their vulnerabilities. And at least I am seeing a strong shift now. Like when I went I used to go to security events. Most of the people were just curious, and now they work in the field. And these uh, in experience shares uh, really uh, evolves the uh, the field. Really evolves uh, the community around it. But we really need to to make it closer the the persons uh, coming to this new field that have uh, almost none prior knowledge uh, because, well, we, we know the basics of how to program, how to operate some machines, but uh, to this deep knowledge that you get from the experience of running it, uh, we will not have. And this is a great barrier for us. Thank you. So you're really underlining the importance of transversal knowledge. And yet in our report, 67% of people who responded from the business and industry sector consider that cyber graduate, the cybersecurity graduates have insufficient capacity of transversal skills. So it's really something that they picked up on. Ismailia is from Gambia. Where is Ismailia? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Over to you, and I think that you're going to tell us a little bit 
about how you think we can diversify the cybersecurity workforce and encourage more women into it. Of course. Um, my name is Ismaila Jawara, and uh, I am from the Gambia, West Africa. A uh, small country, but a uh, little over 2 million people, population. And uh, I am the chair of a uh, cybersecurity community called Gambia Information Security. And I also work as uh, a security analyst, senior security analyst for the Gambia government. And I will share the same similar story as my brother here. You know, I am from a developing country and a country where cybersecurity education is not offered in any university or college. And it's literally um, impossible for someone to be encouraged to pursue a career in cybersecurity. And I stumbled upon it, you know, through uh, one of my mentors, a Peace Corp, a US uh, a citizen who was in the Gambia, actually on a boot camp. And being a curious guy, um, you know, I always was with computers. And, you know, for some reason, which I regret, you know, I had the computer network. And, you know, it was very, very serious, a little bit. And then C brought me in, mentored me. You know, this was back in 2014, 2015. And this is where I kickstart my cybersecurity career first. You know, gave me, you know, some online courses. Now, fast forward to 2019 when I started working for the Gambia government as a security analyst, you know, first, you know, uh, cybersecurity officer in that uh, revenue authority. Um, I realized over the years that women and youth, you know, re are really interested in the industry, you know, more especially Africa, you know, in general. And this obviously looking at the uh, skill gap and also the resources that are needed at the global level, cybersecurity expertise needed at the global level could be an opportunity for African governments, you know, to get youth, you know, into these industries, which is actually going to address youth unemployment at the, at the end of, at, at some point. So I started the community, Gam Gambia Information Security Community to see how best we can involve the academia, you know, and also the government and the youth, you know, leading that discourse and, and the initiative, organizing, you know, boot camps and cybersecurity uh, 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 education programs. And, uh, you know, through our process, we were able to uh, graduate about 50, you know, university students. And this obviously, um, there is this notion, as she mentioned, that Many people think cybersecurity is an IT business or technical job. And that cross coding you know, from moving from legal, you know, to cybersecurity, HR to cybersecurity, you will be surprised. When we first went to the Gambia University, you know, University of the Gambia, you know, we conducted a, a, you know, a research to ask participants from cross coding you know, departments, not just computer science, but also uh, development study students, you know, you have um, uh, 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 the sciences, the, law, the legal department, and you will see, you know, almost 80% of the participants that actually show huge interest in cybersecurity are, you know, not more from the, you know, computer science department. Many of them want to become developers from the computer science department. They want to be develop AI and some other programs. But then you see the legal department, you know, GRC in place, they, they want to get into the industry. So what we did was um, the tango to Cisco, and some we have to give kudos to Cisco and the IC2, you know, certification, IC2 Square recently. They have actually done a great job recently by providing free cybersecurity uh, uh, scholarship for, for, for underprivileged communities and those that want to, in, you know, get into the industry. And we use that opportunity to, to, to train, you know, over 100, you know, uh, youth in, 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 in getting this uh, program. And I am really happy that we have 25 people that have done the ISC2 certification. And obviously, out of these 25, 15 of them are, of course, female, you know, uh, women. And 10, you know, are male. So, and then they have all get their cybersecurity certification. That is the ISC2, you know, initial certification. So literally, this is what I have to share, and then I also encourage collaboration and you know, uh, 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 you know, participating from a different level. You know, when it comes internationally, you know, to involve the global south in these processes as well. 
sort of were interesting because uh, the young people that we talked with during the research told us there was simply not enough online courses, not enough ways to access the cybersecurity sector. I'm wondering how many people here in all raise your hand if you're looking at cybersecurity from the point of view of industry, if your background or your workplace is industry. Please raise your hand so we can see who we are talking to. Industry? One hand. A big one. <laughs> yes, please go ahead. But uh, people like, uh, in my situation, for example, I'm not dedicated 100% uh, to this topic. So it's one of the things that I, so it's, it's less, this is why I don't raise my hand. <laughs> 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 well, uh, does that mean that everyone in the room is more or less working in the education sector? Raise your hand if you consider that you are working in the education sector. There are some hands that weren't raised, and I'm just wondering uh, which sector you, do you represent? Yes. Uh, a microphone. Thank you. Uh, actually, I had a bit of uh, difficulty to raise my hand because I'm half and half uh, between <laughs> education because it's hard to define, whereas uh, either you provide some guidance or knowledge or you inspire policy or you educate uh, as such. So I think there is an overlap between these two areas uh, directly. Can you please tell us a little about yourself? What is your profile? My profile is uh, actually I'm a former police officer. I used to work at Europol, and obviously we are looking at uh, cybersecurity from a bit different angle. But um, to this discussion, I think that this profile um, is especially uh, of interest because uh, for us police officers, uh, there is no barrier between cybersecurity and cyber safety. And I think this is a dilemma here that we should never look at uh, either of each, but at the both at the same time. So, uh, because whenever you take a perspective of a victim, it doesn't matter, really. So, I would appeal here that uh, whatever is planned, as far as, uh, as the strategy is concerned, uh, let's address both, because uh, in the end, it will not matter to the end user or to the end victim. That's the perspective of law enforcement, at least. Thank you. Thank you, and that is really interesting, because I think almost everyone here is involved in safety almost as much as the security. And you'll remember that here we are, internet standards, safety, and security. But thank you for reminding us. I'm wondering, from those people that we haven't heard from yet, do you have any really great examples, some good practice from your country that you think that we could all learn from and that it would help us as we go forward in building the cyber hub? Do you, is there anyone who'd like to take the microphone and tell us about good practice in their country to add to what we've learnt here so far? No? Would you like to take the microphone and tell us your point of view? Anyone? Yes, take it around. No one? I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know there were people behind us. <laughs> Thanks so much. Uh, I'm Clay from FIRST, the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams. Um, my previous job was working with the Pacific, and I think you mentioned Samoa earlier, um, so I can use a, an example from Samoa, but it's an example that you can see in Tonga, Solomons, PNG, and across the Pacific. Um, you know, obviously being small island countries, they have a lot of challenges um, with retaining and building cyber skills, just like the rest of us, but almost more amplified just due to the size, size of the, the, the countries. Um, and one of the most effective ways that we've seen um, to build a more sustainable cyber skill um, community is through kind of organic um, cyber community groups, um, potentially like uh, what, what you've been working on, Andrew. Um, 
So in Samoa, a few years ago, a bunch of folks came together just over breakfast and created something called Samoa Information Technology Association. Um, this creates a space for training to occur, um, not just from external donors coming in and delivering training, but training between um, professionals within Samoa. Um, it creates an informal space for you know, industry knowledge to be shared, so similar to what happens in network operator groups, so very much an informal place um, to talk shop. Um, and for, for what we've seen, this space creates, creates kind of that missing gap that folks were mentioning between the academic side and the industry side because it's where newcomers to the field can talk and meet and network and learn lessons directly from current active um, operational experts. Um, so yeah, Samoa Information Technology Association, you have Tonga Women in ICT. Again, that was just started over coffee at a coffee shop. Um, so while hubs are really, really great, um, I think it's really important to leave that space for informal information sharing as well, not just formal trainings and things like that. And that really is, I think, a very interesting idea, training each other and this idea of community which you mentioned. Is there anyone else who'd like to tell us a little bit about good practice, something that they've been involved in, they think really made a difference and we could take it on board as we move off with this hub? Yes, please, take the floor again. I hope it will be useful. Uh, my experience originates uh, from the EU policy cycle. So um, it very much helps as far as the strategy is concerned. Um, we used to base, when I was working uh, at the EU agency, we used to base our uh, strategy on findings of the research. So first, as you've mentioned, uh, the report is obviously very useful, but uh, it's necessary also to look at uh, what is uh, current experience and what are uh, the threats of online threats. As you said, uh, there is a nice bridge between practitioners and uh, the learners. So uh, it's always very important to look at the real cases and investigate them, research them, and then plan accordingly the research cycle or the policy cycle uh, because um, I have also witnessed uh, facts uh, and, and uh, uh, instances when uh, policy was not relevant to what's happening online, for example, when there was a big gap uh, and strategy was, drawn, was um, prepared in silos. This is the worst case scenario. So as far as EU policy cycle came into uh, the force, and maybe this will be a useful uh, good practice uh, for this forum as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do think that's extremely interesting because one of the first things that we were thinking of doing with the hub was going into universities, perhaps with a survey or beginning by interviews to understand how cybersecurity is being taught. But what you're telling us is that we should also be looking at the cases. And so our hub should be uh, should have an easy mode of recording cases so that we can really link the two. Are there any other ideas, because we're really starting out now, we're over the next days pushing forward to see how we're going to develop this hub, what it will really look like. We really thank you for your input and your input. Um, are there any other ideas? We'd really love to hear from you. You've come to the session. I'm sure you've got ideas at the back of your mind, so please ask for the microphone or speakers. What have you got to add? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I can add a quick idea. Uh, maybe what the hub can consider doing is like retaining uh, the talent uh, as we know, maybe colleagues from the private sector can comment more, but the, the, the job is very stressful uh, and I think uh, most of the cybersecurity experts leave, uh, leave their jobs, so what do we do to keep them at their post? So this is something, a question for the table.
Uh, yes, the cybersecurity job is very stressful. <laughs> because uh, there are many incident response you need to take in care, you need to do to the clients uh, to to be safe or the, to defense the, those attacks or something. So uh, it's very stressful and um, sometimes 24 hours, you know, uh, but uh, and sometimes some people leaving that they don't want to do this job anymore and go to go back to the software engineering, coding or do something other job. And what we have to do is, of course, you can raise the salary is a good idea, but it's just temporary. Yes, I think we need to think about their quality of life, uh, not to no pressures. Uh, you need to take in care of the quality of life, more something uh, different ways to make them to be comfortable to work for the cybersecurity job. So I think that's why we do like uh, uh, if they want to attend this conference, uh, let them go. Or if they want to do the training, I uh, just uh, let them do it. Or we we always think about something what they want, and maybe if we can accept, then we just give them that kind of offer. Yeah. You want to uh, I think we we could have also a mind shift because usually the cybersecurity team is responsible for this cybersecurity. And if you put the whole uh, co responsibility uh, into like this team, which are usually very small, you bring a lot of stress to them because uh, it's it's kind of uh, difficult to work when you you are in this cybersecurity team because everybody even inside the company see you as an enemy because you are trying to impose, you are trying to push things and make things harder, more difficult to them. And so you have this kind of uh, difficult relation because you are responsible for the security and you also uh, have very difficulty to implement the security changes. Right, I'm going to, and I it's really interesting, we haven't talked about that stress, about that quality of life, so we see more and more things that the hub should take into account. Katerina, can you please remind us of the priorities? What were the answers of the first question, please? No problem. I can even show them again. Yes, I, I think, think it's... It's the best idea. And then we're going to have a brief summary of what we've looked at. Larry's going to raise some of the points so that we can do some final discussion about these issues. So, yes. Okay, so uh, let's, I think, the first one, yeah? Because we haven't talked about the first one. Uh, so uh, key functions of the hub. And the first priority for most of our audience is to promote co collaboration between industry, universities, and the cybersecurity workforce. And I think that we all know that this is, uh, this is something very popular here, that we are working between different stakeholders. Uh, then the second one is enhance cybersecurity skills at all levels of education. Uh, the third one is gather and scale up good practice from cybersecurity and tertiary sectors. The fourth one, raise interest in careers in the cybersecurity industry. And the fifth one is provide online training from top experts on emerging topics, which I find is quite interesting because in our second question, uh, creating an online platform for trainings and, and workshops is the second best, right? And here it's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> and that is interesting. Yeah, it I, is. If we can get you to reflect on that, if we can figure out why that might be, I'm going to ask you, Larry, to give us a brief rundown of what you've picked up, uh, Larry, is also from the United States and a CBIT. Well, come on, you should 
tell us a little bit of your background, a little more than what you've told us, so that we can see the angle that you're coming from? Well, I'm a recovering academic. It's been many years since I've been at a university, but I came to technology from an academic perspective and then became a technical writer, uh, wrote a newspaper column in the United States, actually still write it. It's been running for almost 40 years, written for the Los Angeles Times, New York Times, now the Mercury News. I've uh, been on national radio and television with CBS News. I've worked with the BBC and other news. So I've come in from a, a variety of uh, angles. I guess I can't keep a job, so I keep switching careers. Um, <laughs> I'm a mid-career person, change myself. Um, you know, really thinking about how you can take the kinds of things that we're talking about here, or the kinds of things we talk about at universities, the types of things that engineers talk about, the types of things that policy people talk about, and translate them to average people, to people who read at an eighth grade level, parents, kids, teachers, folks, the kind of people who listen to me on radio, which are just any everyday people, most of whom have never been to a Minergate governments forum, most of whom have never taught at the university, uh, most of whom have never worked in the tech industry, but they probably have a smartphone, they probably have a computer, they probably have kids that are using the technology, and so they are, have a very strong vested interest. So that's where I come from this. But I have been listening carefully to your conversation today, and clearly my notes only reflect a small portion of what was said. And so if you said something brilliant and I didn't get it down, uh, accept my apologies, uh, but this is sort of what I took away. One is making, well, first of all, I want to put another context. About 20 years ago, I attended a conference at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh where this very problem was being articulated. So this is not a new conversation, as everybody in this room knows. It's been an ongoing issue for many, many years. So I just wanted to kind of throw that in to, to the hopper, uh, which is to why we need to make it more attractive to youth to work in cyber uh, security. A couple of people pointed out that the gap is not closing. I think it was that the problem grows by 10, 20% a year. The human power to solve the problem grows by 10% a year. You don't have to be an MIT graduate to figure out that that math is not working. So that was a really clear statement that was said. Um, also bringing the right people together to create the content, and that gets into something I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, which is the interdisciplinary approach. What I heard over and over today is this is not something that simply comes out of the engineering side of the, uh, the equation. You need to bring in you social scientists, you, men, you know, humanities, um, people from all walks of life and all disciplines need to be approaching this problem. You can't solve it simply by code. Code's important, but there's so many other factors including social issues and norms, et, et cetera. Um, Janice, I think, made a really good opening statement that I think it should be part of the overall um, discussion, sort of the foundation, which is with companies looking for critical thinking, creativity, holistic thinking, and diversity. And that's so important, and those things tend to get overlooked when you're looking for people who you think just have the right technical skills, but don't necessarily have the creati creative skills, uh, critical thinking skills, the holistic look at uh, the world, and of course, as we t many people have talked about, don't necessarily reflect the workforce and the communities that we should be serving, and that's where diversity comes in. Uh, I love this comment someone made. I apologize, I don't know who it was. Educators tend to focus on coding but not teaching young people about how things function. Uh, what's the backbone of the internet? How does cloud computing work? Understanding the gestalt, what it is you're trying to fix is really important uh, if you're trying to fix it. It would be like if you were a uh, refrigerator repairman who's never used a refrigerator. You might know where the parts go, but would you know what they do and why they're there? Um, I love the comment about cybersecurity is important for primary and secondary education. Uh, some think it should be mandatory, but clearly it needs to be something we start talking about very early and getting people excited about. I mean, you know, we have, yeah, it's true we've got, right now, at least in the United States, we have close to full employment. But that's a temporary thing. There are many, many periods where we have far more Im applicants and we have jobs. And there are, I don't know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of cybersecurity jobs uh, that are open in, 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 in the world, and certainly even in, in the country I come from. Uh, also, I think another person, or several people made the comments, talked about factories, farms. 
that this is not just a tech sector problem, that no matter what it is you do, whatever industry you're in, you need cybersecurity specialists. I mean, it's almost like, you know, every company needs a chief financial officer or someone to do the books. You know, every company needs somebody to, you know, clean the floor, whatever it is. Well, every company needs somebody to watch cybersecurity. I don't care if you're a small organization or a multinational corporation, someone there needs to be thinking about cybersecurity. Even in my little NGO, we don't have a dedicated person for it, but we sure have to pay attention to it because like everybody, there are attacks against our infrastructure as well. Um, we just might, okay, someone, a couple of people mentioned creating opportunities in developing countries. Gosh, that's important. Uh, first of all, there are problems in developing countries that need to be addressed. And second of all, there's a huge talent pool in the world that is not being uh, used, not being exploited. I don't mean exploited in the negative term, but taking, you know, all the terms are negative, taking advantage of, but you know what I'm saying, not being utilized. That's the word I'm looking for. And we, we really need to, to utilize people from around the world. You know, we tend to think about that. I pick up the phone, I call a company, and I get somebody with an accent somewhere in the world, usually doing a relatively entry-level position. Well, there are very smart people in other parts of the world besides the developed world who could be doing high-level work, and we, we just can't afford not to take advantage of that talent. Um, I really like the comment about giving high school students real experience. Uh, you're really getting them involved. There's such talent among high school kids, and I shouldn't even call them kids. Many of them are capable of actually doing serious work, and while I would never advocate child labor, <coughs> I do advocate taking advantage of young people's ability to be part of the solution. And, and young people, and also to sh see cybersecurity as a place where they can go into college, or maybe not even go to college, maybe find jobs in cybersecurity directly out of high school. There's certainly plenty of work, and probably talented people who could work with or without a college education. Um, someone made the comment, and it gets back to the comment I made about the sort of joke I made about the refrigerator. Visiting a factory, the cybersecurity specialist needing to understand how the factory works how each machine, I believe it was you that made that, that point. And again, you can't fix something in a vacuum. You really have to understand the context in which it works. And I think that should be generally very important to any kind of a hub based on what I heard today. Um, lots of graduates need have insufficient knowledge about real world applications. Again, the same notion, you need to have a gestalt, a real understanding. Someone made the comment about networking, and I'm going to combine that with the suggestion someone made that more young people should be coming to conferences like these. And I have to tell you something. 90% of what I learn at conferences like the IGF doesn't happen in meetings like this. And with all due respect to the brilliant people who just spoke, and all of you were very good, it's the conversations you have in the hallway. It's the connections you make. Uh, that networking, it's just the same thing you get at a university. Why do Harvard... Students tend to do better than people at other schools because they meet people who can make open doors for them. In the last 12 hours, not even that, I guess I've been here probably eight hours, I've already opened so many doors and so many things that I can do with my little NGO based on people I've talked to since I got here this morning. It, it's, it's amazing to me what I've accomplished in the last few hours just walking around talking to people. And so getting young people as part of those conversations are so important. You know, connecting them with mentors, connecting them with each other, uh, it, it's just essential. Um, the other, I guess the last one, which I thought was very interesting, is this comment about how cybersecurity is stressful, and I could see that. It's probably one of those jobs, like the joke they talk about airline pilots, you know, a flight is, you know, six hours of pure boredom and three seconds of sheer terror. Um, when the system goes down, and maybe it doesn't go down that often, but when it does, it's hard for you to imagine what, it, what the cybersecurity staff have to go through. I mean, I kind of imagine because our systems have gone down and we, we had connectsafely.org go down literally an hour before Safer Internet Day event. And we had to panic and luckily we found somebody who could bring our system back up in time for our event when we were going on national television promoting what we were doing. And like that was the last worst possible time for our system to go down. Well. Those moments are very, very stressful. And finding ways to encourage people, to retain them, to promote them, to compensate them uh, properly, to provide them with career advancement, all the things you need to keep a workforce happy and productive is, is very important. And 
I would say that, you know, for a hub, and again, I came into this knowing very little, just taking notes. What I think I learned today from listening to all of you is that this hub that you build has to be something that goes from the highest level conceptualization about what it is you're trying to do, and we also learned this from your little survey, what it is you're trying to accomplish, what are the goals, what are the frameworks, all the way down to the nitty gritty of how it operates, and I would even argue maybe even some kind of a job bank where you help people, link people who are looking for work to the, work, to the jobs that are out there. So, you know, it, it's a big, a big effort that you're taking on, but um, it seems to me, despite what I said about going to sessions, this session was extremely productive because you came away with a very kind of rich blueprint uh, of what you need to do, what we need to do, what the world needs to do to have a more secure uh, cyber infrastructure and to provide good paying, meaningful, and important jobs to probably millions of people around the world. Thanks very much, Larry. And I'm going to start with Raul. And I would like each of our speakers to just have a few words, some last thoughts to wrap up this session. But of course, if there are people in the audience who also want to have a few words, you are most welcome. <coughs> yes, thank you. Uh, oh, I found uh, every comment very interesting, and uh, but especially what Hiko said about the, the, the that we have to understand that this is probably and this is very interesting because uh, maybe the, the, the companies should start to hire people which already with the idea that these are people that will uh, work in these positions just for, for a short term. And so maybe just to, to offer a plan, uh, a growing plan so to move to other area of the, in the uh, inside of the technology uh, area of the company. Uh, I think that's all the, uh, what's, uh, really concerns me is that the the, the idea of uh, scalability is a uh, is uh, uh, because uh, we we speak about uh, providing training on, on a platform yes but how many people we can train on a platform uh, is uh, what we can do really to uh, 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 achieve things that uh, uh, in a different dimension uh, so quantitatively this uh, uh, different. So I think that, um, we say that that uh, that there is a demand of talents that is not satisfied. But at the same time, I don't know how are it's being calculated because if we calculate how many people we need to face those challenges, so yes, we need more more people. But on the other hand, how many people, at least in Latin America, how many companies are really hiring as a uh, especially? So I think that's. Probably, if if they if they look for more people, if they if the the demand is increasing, so more people will want to 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 work in the in this area, and so this is a, a, a complicated equation because uh, probably that's a, we need uh, public support to, for private sector to understand what uh, is what the challenge and what to do, but. But we have also the same uh, problems at the public sector because public sector don't understand either. That that's <laughs> the the problem. I, I mentioned two cases in Latin America that were very serious in the in, uh, in in the last year. So maybe we should work with intergovernmental organizations more, trying to convince them about the, the really the dimension of the problem and how we can involve them to be part of the, pr the of the solution instead of being part of the problem say okay, how we can work together to work with the pub, pub, a private sector but an education system so so really to understand that this is a problem for the country for the region for the world that's and to uh, elevate the, the the level of the uh, of the priority thank you Yes, Katerina, also, has anyone come online? Do you see anyone who has raised a question? Unfortunately not, but oh. we have some listeners. So. Okay, great. And do you have anything you'd like to add to this discussion? Um. <laughs> I, can, I can have a question, okay. Um, uh, I, I think I, m my opinion might be either controversial or very boring. It depends how you look at it. But I think that we are at a point where 
um, each company should have a cybersecurity specialist like we have a work safety specialist, yes? So we learn that when you see water on the floor, you should avoid it because you will slip on it and fall, and fall over. Uh, I think it should be the same for cybersecurity now because we all use computers at some points and even if we think about industries that normally we would say, oh, they do not use computers, we have now a situation mm, in our country, in Poland, that uh, many, many more people in medical industry are starting to use computers. Um, the system for, for doctors is in the computers, so nurses also should have access there, and we are going to continue to spread this thing. So I think it's just necessary to have, uh, to have this awareness that uh, there will be more and more specialists needed in the field and we should uh, start training those people because it might uh, shock us soon. Thanks, Katerina. Dennis, do you... Sorry, there's one here. Thank you. I think very quickly, at the end of the day, it all comes to incentives, uh, either to people or to companies, uh, like a major company will not be able to afford their online, like Amazon, to uh, to be off because of cybersecurity. There are incentives there. Uh, from the UN perspective, if we want to reach out to uh, stakeholders, Global Digital Compact discussions coming up uh, in 2024, uh, this is plus 20 overall review, uh, which is also coming up uh, in 2025. I'm just putting those on the table. Uh, those are the areas that you can, uh, we can uh, hear your voices and we can, you can lobby. And this cybersecurity hub, whatever uh, you are developing, if it's if it's good, it will be used by governments. So it's again back to incentives. If if you put a good product out there, then they, it will be used. But uh, it's all I think all for all of us uh, to improve it. Super, and that is an incentive. Uh, yes, m many important things were uh, mentioned here. So maybe I will just focus on uh, on a thing that comes from my professional um, experience. So I think that. What is really important, among, of course, other things, is education from the beginning and uh, integrating cybersecurity, uh, safety education uh, into uh, curricula, into education, and uh, maybe resigning from traditional methods uh, for the sake of unconventional and involving uh, methods, met methods uh, to really, uh, well, that, that was mentioned many times here, that really make these young people to understand uh, the tools they are using and uh, not like, like understand the, the mechanism. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Julia. I think, it, it, I don't know if you wanted, no? And I really love that fun idea. We have a project running in the Scandinavian countries. It's been running for about four years where we write a scenario uh, about internet safety for 11 to 14 year olds, but then we find a local magician and the magician and I work together to figure out what are the best tricks. And of course, the tricks in Iceland are quite different from the ones we do in Finland or Norway. But this fun element seems to be so important. I'm really glad that I think it was you, uh, you, you who mentioned that. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, Security Hub is a very interesting concept because uh, in our training center also, we were discussing internally, we should be uh, uh, co uh, collaborating with other global entities. We have some fri friends in UK and France, etc. that we can have more possible uh, diverse collaborations. But uh, one thing about uh, Security Hub is that uh, we are all busy. So if Security Hub is gonna be super complex stuff, then nobody will be involved. So I want to <laughs> have it uh, uh, less demanding or less uh, workload. In terms of workload, it should be less binding. 
so that uh, everybody from uh, all scales, like non-profits and the government agencies, etc., like like IGF, everybody on all sides can join on non-binding basis. But uh, this should also be network of trust because this can be abused by criminals. So uh, network of trust is uh, very important for this uh, uh, project to be successful. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I have a message for uh, industry, business, and sector, and uh, this is the also the um <coughs> goal for us. Because I, I want to say that the education sector is uh, uh, open for cooperation. And I mean not only the IT business, but also, you know, the motor company, uh, fashion industry, food in industry, and, and so on. And uh, I'm, I deeply uh, believe that, you know, next year we'll find, you know, mo more people from the industry. And thank you all once again that you are with us. So let's think out of the box. Yes, and I would continue with this stress um, of from Dennis that came on the diversity. Some time ago, I took, I took part in a panel about women in IT, in IT. And women participating in this panel, they also uh, said that this kind of a stress and war field that is somehow related with work in the cybersecurity discourage men and women to take part in this, uh, in this business, to go into these careers. So maybe extremely important is to repeat that not only you have to work really in this war field to be involved in the cybersecurity, that there's so many different competences involved, like Jenny started in the, in the beginning, like that you don't really have to be in this gaming area that some people like perceive uh, the cybersecurity is. Uh, and second thing, I think it's extremely important also talking about diversity, to open eyes of parents, to really be able to motivate their girls, their daughters, to see their future in this uh, in this field, because right now you always see uh, boys in the coding extra classes and the girls go to dancing classes. So it needs uh, parental awareness. All right, uh, thank you for everything. Uh, actually, I learned from you guys a lot about your insight, comment, and new information from me. And actually, uh, Next week, I have, my, I have my daughter is high school, and the high school principal asked me to talk about cybersecurity job. So uh, actually, I have to do this uh, since we, we've discussing this kind of uh, session. So I want to tell them, I will tell them the cybersecurity is very uh, fun job, and it's very important job, and also it's very proud job. And it's also a challenge job. It's going to be a very uh, interesting job for ever. So I just want them to be uh, <coughs> more interesting about the cybersecurity job. And also, I want to uh, think about something. Maybe we need something in the cybersecurity hub ecosystem uh, so that we can do more uh, to the sustainable uh, like SDGs. We, we need to keep thinking to keep maintain this kind of uh, conversation uh, in the near future. Thank you so much. Well, uh, I will spend my last uh, words talking about the importance of the uh, actually uh, the culture on being this uh, facilitator, this, uh, well, uh, ab uh, how they help to create the imaginary, how to they mold people to like cybersecurity. And for that, I would like to remember about two films, Hackers and War Games, which were very important for the 80s uh, generation to see uh, hackers as the, these very cool people that were hacking things and this, how this created the cybersecurity uh, imaginary. And also, when we talk about it, uh, we need to think of the uh, gender perspective because, well, I opened a position in my crew to recruit a woman and I couldn't. Like, it stayed for one month open. When I gave up, I hired a man in the next day. So uh, this is really a cultural thing and we really need to, uh, to work on it. 
So your key is going to have to be very convincing when he goes into that school next week. So, yes. Um, so uh, my last input will solely, you know, uh, uh, relate with what he said, but more importantly, um, having more women, you know, participating in this industry. And I think obviously this we are unaware of, but, you know, it's some form of a culture. Like, for example, um, when I take my niece and nephew to the shop, you know, to get toys for them, um, you know, for Christmas, you go to the boys store, you know, shop, you get amazing stuff, you know, so many amazing cool toys. You go to the, uh, uh, the you know, uh, uh, the guy, the girls shop, you get some, um, uh, unicorn. I'm not saying unicorns are not nice or whatsoever, but my point is, you know, culturally we need to also, it's as if we are actually grooming, you know, them not to be innovative and also uh, involved in these creative industries. And that being the case, you know, um, I think industries like companies or businesses should also be giving priorities to women, you know, to, to participate in, you know, in cybersecurity. And my advice for my brother, I also s experienced similar in my office, but then um, what I did was, uh, rather than giving them, because it's a state level, you know, step by step, rather than looking for, you know, an expert in reverse engineering or someone who has, you know, years of experience, I, you know, went for GRC, you know, uh, personnel. So when I was not able to get someone, you know, I got just got a lady who studied law and then gave her, you know, opportunity, and then she did tremendously well. So I think, you know, the bar also, or how we er get them on board, you know, need to be looked at. If you want to pick them from a perspective where we are looking for expert, we are going to chase them out. Thank you. And thank you. I'm wondering if the audience has any last word that they'd like to add. It's really important that everyone feels that they've had their say. Anyone over that side want to take the microphone for a last thought about this hub? Because we're going to be calling on all of you. Yes, come on behind me. We're going to be calling on all of you to really support us in this. It seems so important. Would you like... <laughs> You would? There's a microphone somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> no? <laughs> no? No one further? Well, I hope that you're going to join us in this enterprise. We are determined, after what we learnt with the report, that we really have to move forward. We have to move forward together. And... We talked about safety and security, but in French, sécurité is the same word, and possibly in other languages also. No one can be safe if we don't have this security. I hope we're going to continue working together. If you have any ideas, please come up and tell us, because we're chasing ideas now when we're working on this strategy strategic plan. Thank you very much for joining the session. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, Larry. And I, well, we'll be meeting in the corridors and talking further about this. So thanks for a very interactive session. Right.